Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. I can tell you everything about Main Man. Why and what and how and whether it was exciting or not. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. A very long, wonderful adventure. Hello and welcome to episode 22 in our series exploring the history of Main Man, the groundbreaking management rights company that completely transformed the business side of rock and roll in the 70s becoming synonymous with the decadence, extravagance and indulgences that are now part of rock folklore. When he originally tried to get us to wear the makeup, you know, Ronson was like, oh, from being from the North, not bloody going to do that to me, I'm not wearing that. <laughs> you know, I think he was ready to go back to Hull when he mentioned that. Main Man was formed by entrepreneur and impresario Tony DeFries, who worked with a diverse range of clients that included Mick Ronson, Amanda Lear, Lou Reed, Mott the Hoople, John Mellencamp, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Iggy Pop and David Bowie. Our respective girlfriends and wives and whatever put together all these really ridiculous cartoon capers, comic hero costumes and they're all sort of superhero things. In this episode, we're marking the 50th anniversary of David's first visit to America in January 1971 which was a short tour to promote the release of The Man Who Sold the World album. The visit was instigated by Mercury Records' American publicist, Ron Oberman, who was convinced of Bowie's potential and hoped that a promo tour would help raise his profile in the US. Ron flew from the Mercury head office in Chicago to London in late 1970 to meet with David's manager, Tony DeFries, and persuaded him that a short promo tour would benefit both David and The Man Who Sold the World. Following on from Michael Oberman's recollections in the last Main Man episode about the US angle on David's visit, here Tony provides a unique UK perspective. We'd already been talking to Mercury, specifically Irwin, and Ron McBride, who was head of a So we hadn't yet discussed the possibility of buying back the Masters. We were still in the phase of trying to get a promotional effort from Mercury in the US. And rather than trying to send David on some kind of a live performance tour, which would have meant putting him on the bottom of a bill with various other acts, and which Mercury weren't very willing to pay for, we decided it would be more realistic, more functional, if you like, to let him do a personal radio tour rather than performance, but to go to America, meet up with press, music, or other press folk, try and get some coverage of the new album, and try to get some exposure on radio stations. And this kind of arrangement, this kind of tour, was very often the first way to get an audience in the US. So we arranged that with Mercury and started out by sending David on his own and he met up there with various people and one of them was Ron Aberman. Ron had been introduced to David's music by his brother, Michael. And Michael had written a review of some, perhaps the earlier Bowie album, the one with Space Oddity on, but subsequently Ron suggested to David that he might consider RCA Records as a possible record company because they didn't have very much in the way of contemporary artists. They were primarily country and rock and roll really in the form of the Presley era, but not much in the way of modern, new, if you like, 60s, 70s rock. And that was a disadvantage for them in the marketplace, but simply because they didn't have that sort of act, new acts were less likely to be in their focus, and the same acts 
that might have approached RCA that were major 60s acts generally looked to other record companies, Atlantic or CBS, that already had a significant presence in the space. So RCA were still going along with the Wayland Jennings, Dolly Parton, very much a country stable, clearly not where Bowie was headed. Later on, Ron Aberman actually ended up at CBS and became instrumental in trying to promote Iggy, who we ultimately had signed to a CBS lease tape arrangement, but that we'll get to later. As we would say, that's another story. Meanwhile, Ron and David, along with people like John Mendelssohn, who'd written a very nice review, I think more than one actually, on Bowie's work, was a big fan. So they met up with people like John and others. David went to a private house party and played for assembled guests, some of whom were music people, producers. I think Peter Ayres was one of them. And he generally began to create a little group of people in the Rolling Stone and similar music journals. And even in the LA Times, he would get a certain amount of press for his lyrics, for his structure, not so much for the music at that point, but as much as about. He was clearly different. And of course, he also went to LA wearing his dress and he went to different places, radio stations in different parts of America. I think Ron accompanied him on quite a lot of these um, journeys where David would appear in a dress or another outfit that was similarly unusual. He was always looking like something different than the standard rock star or the standard country star. He had this Lauren Bacall long hair. He often wore makeup. And when he didn't wear a dress, he tended to wear other unusual outfits. And that made him interesting. As well as which he was well-read and well-versed, and so he could talk about different subjects that were not the normal fare. And it did begin to build up a dedicated following. All of this gave him a bit of a foothold in at least American press circles. And in some cases, radio stations, particularly in places like Cleveland, um, some stations in L.A., None of it was enough to move sales of the Holy Holy single, for example, which was the first release from the Man Who Sold the World album, and which was really the main thrust of that particular personal appearance tour. It didn't actually create any significant movement, but people did hear about it. Some magazines wrote about it. It didn't really change anything, and so at the end of quite a short visit, he came back. For David, it changed quite a lot, because in that trip through the US, where he'd never been before, he got a completely different view. And people like Ron Oberman, I think, helped with that, because they specifically took him to places where he wouldn't necessarily have gone on his own and introduced him to people that he wouldn't have necessarily met. David got a lot of inspiration from America in terms of seeing things very different than when you see things, for example, on the TV of the time. If you were watching television in England in the 1960s and 70s, you never really saw America. What you got was pictures of America, visions of America, if you like. But actually being in America, actually being in Manhattan or being in Los Angeles or being in Chicago is very different than seeing what was essentially a television view of it or a magazine view of it. And this is something that really helped David with his next round of songs when he started 
writing songs that had an American influence, things like Gene Genie, Panic in Detroit, even some of the earlier songs on Hunky Dory. He had a different perspective about what happened over there. And that was very valuable and decidedly helped him to make contact with American fans and create something that American fans would like because it was so different than what they were used to seeing. That, I think, was the upside, if you like, the benefit. And getting some of those people, like Ron, who then followed him, and probably Michael too, through his next two or three years of becoming Bowie, and becoming Bowie, especially in the US, becoming Bowie in America, Having that group of people and the journalists that they were influenced and then the press that we subsequently brought over, all of that led to a moment where David did conquer America. And part of that, a big part of that, was his first impressions, which even though it might have taken one or two years to turn them into songs, those songs were very powerful and still are today. Now we're looking at all of this through the lens of today's holy, holy celebration by the holy, holy traveling band, which often features new artists or artists of the moment, artists like Deborah Harry, but is essentially made up of Visconti and Woody, the only if you like, members of that Man Who Sold the World group who are still able to perform. The reaction from Mercury Records when you delivered the master tapes of The Man Who Sold the World were underwhelming, to say the least. What sort of comments did they make to you about David and what they expected from him at the time? I really didn't ever get into a discussion of whether or not they liked Bowie because from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to make a lease tape arrangement where we could get the recordings back. I didn't want to give them another recording. And that meant that I had to, on the one hand, persuade them that they weren't doing enough to promote him and make it a costly affair if they were going to promote him by basically insisting that we get a band, that we rehearse or we take the band we had and bring them to America and go on headline dates. And they would not have agreed to that. And I knew without suggesting it, they wouldn't agree to that because, again, even if we'd done that, they still have ended up with recordings. I have believed, even though I hadn't heard them yet, but I still believe that David's recordings were going to be enormously valuable and I wanted to be in control of them. And I wasn't going to get that from Mercury under the contract they had And there wasn't any reason for them to change that contract drastically. We're talking about a drastic change. For them to give me what I wanted would mean that they'd have to literally renegotiate from scratch, including the album we just made or were in the busy making and the album he'd made with Space Oddity on it. I didn't see that as a likely outcome, mainly because my dealings with Irwin, which very often reflected in the mails back and forth for nearly a year, made it quite clear, because I think we started doing that before the summer of 1970 or in the summer of 1970. So we'd been in discussion and in correspondence. And what we discovered was that Mercury were treating their contract like every other contract and treating David as an artist like every other artist waiting for that hit record, waiting for something significant to happen before they were going to spend more money. Getting them to do this little personal appearance tour was something that I believed would give David a better experience of getting closer to an American audience so he could make recordings that would excite an American audience. And at the same time, would get enough interest for other record companies to be willing to perhaps take over a new contract 
that was always a little difficult because what you basically had to do was promote your artist to record companies that didn't even know he was available because they believed he was a Mercury artist, while at the same time not alerting Mercury to the fact that you were in conversation with other record companies and trying to pursue a policy of getting him out of his existing contracts with or without the original recordings. It was always nice to get the existing catalogue, but not always possible. But in this case, it became possible. Now, why didn't Mercury embrace David as an artist? Well, first of all, Irwin was old school. He only was willing to put money into an artist when they'd had a money-making record. In other words, if he wasn't in the, the black, he was reluctant to spend more money than was necessary to make the next record, be it single or album, to put it out, i.e. put out a single without putting out a whole album because it's cheaper, and spend the minimum on promotion, but don't spend any money on performance until the actors actually sold records. So from Owen's perspective, David was still a failure and would still be a failure until he had, at a minimum, at least a charting single. And even though he'd had one, it wasn't enough to get them over the possibility that might be a one-time novelty record and nothing else would ever happen, because that was also very common in the industry at the time, where you had one record that took off and was a, a big hit, but then the same act, for whatever reason, the artist or the band, never got to making another record that had that particular quality that made it a hit. So record companies tended to say, if the artist doesn't get a record that either sells a lot or at least makes it into the charts somewhere, then we're going to restrict how much money we spend until we see that happen. And if we don't see it happen after a few releases, whether it be albums or singles, we'll probably let the next option go. I didn't want to wait for that either because waiting for the option to be given up would mean that I'd have to delay making another album and essentially put David on hold. That wasn't what he needed. What he needed was momentum and exposure. So Irrespective of whether Mercury were going to let him go, we did start doing concerts in the UK. We did start doing costumes. We started doing makeup and hair and all kinds of stuff. And we made a long-term attempt to put together a very tight band. Lots of rehearsals, lots of reviews, lots of set changes, small concerts that weren't profitable, with small audiences, but what we got was a sort of momentum and fan club and a level of interest from people like the BBC or promoters. Something's happening unusual and different. And when we were ready, we could bring people over from the States to look at that, but we weren't ready in the 1970, 71 year. Now, People at Mercury who were enthusiastic about David, including, obviously, Ron, and even though Michael wasn't at Mercury at the time, he was a music journalist for a Washington paper, he was still a Bowie fan. So we had at least these two fans. At Mercury, briefly, was Calvin Lee, or Calvin Mark Lee, who was a scout for talent. And even though Dave was already signed to Mercury, he still came to England and met up. And this, I think, happened before I met David and Angela. But then he was still on the scene briefly after I met them. But he didn't um, persuade Mercury that David was going to be enormous. He spent quite a few months in England. And eventually they said, well, nothing's happened, so you should forget it. And he was recalled. Um, he didn't remain with Mercury after that, so David lost one of his supporters. Robin McBride, who was head of a &R, was a supporter of David's, but couldn't find a formula that would make his music popular. 
And even if he had found one, it's unlikely that he could have persuaded David to change his style or his writing or his composition or his recording in a way that would satisfy American radio and and or Irwin. So he, although he probably tried to persuade Irwin to spend more money or put more effort behind David, um, he wasn't successful. And only these two people realistically, Ron and Robin, were supporters at Mercury. And they were essentially on the opposite path to Irwin. And when Irwin saw a chance that he might be able to recover his money, although I don't think he believed, frankly, that I would say, OK, how much do you want? But by asking the question, he opened himself up to me saying just that. And of course, at that point, it was game over. So I think that really is the answer to that question. Irwin simply didn't have the vision to say, it's different, it's strange, it wears a dress, it's got long hair, it sings in a peculiar voice, but it writes great songs. Yeah, that's, that's what he should have said. He didn't say that. So I said that. And despite all the setbacks and the obstacles, and there were many, I was right. <laughs> and, and David ultimately became a global superstar and frequently voted to be the most important uh, musical performing talent, even now many years after his death. David returned from that visit re-energised by some of the great music he heard and the interesting people that he met. How do you remember his reaction at the time? One of the big differences between America and England at this moment in time when he's listening to Iggy is that it's not OK to be transgender or gay or have more than one sexual identity, or even be a boy who's willing to have sex with men, even though he's not necessarily transgender or gay, or a girl who's willing to have sex with a girl. Those were all completely off limits in England. They were criminal offences if you got caught. America seemed to be open to boys and boys and girls and girls and boys and girls and and nobody made too much of a fuss about it and that enchanted david frankly it was like wow this country is so free and remember he's going to san francisco in the era of san francisco being the still flower power and hippie and happy and the um if you like the capital of the world's children who can do whatever they like. And he's going to LA, the film capital of the world, to Hollywood. So of course he sees something very, very different here. Very different than the restrictions of English upper-class behavior, which are forced on English middle-class behavior. David comes from Beckenham in Bromley. It's definitely not a cultural center, and it's certainly not a center of free love or free life. So he sees America as the place he wants to be, and he sees Iggy as an American boy who can be anything and everything, and doesn't come from particularly splendid background, but comes from a background that's actually not much better, possibly slightly worse, than David's own background. But here he is, He's an American hero and an American rock star in David's eyes. Not quite true of Iggy, of course, but it could have been true. Actually, it has eventually become true, even though it took quite a long time. But Iggy is an icon of rock and roll. So I think that's what David was captivated by. And frankly, once I met Iggy and once I listened to his stuff and once I talked to him, James Osterberg Jr. was well-read and well-educated he actually had a parents who were teachers. He often portrayed himself as coming from a sort of white trash background that wasn't true. He had actually read Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and a bunch of other interesting authors, and he could talk about them. The problem with Iggy was he was 
massively caught up in drug addiction. He never got away from it. So eventually it, his career had ups and downs. But in the period that I was dealing with him, he essentially made enormous mistakes in trying to handle a very large and problematic drug habit and one that he shared with many members of his band. And so the net result, the Stooges didn't support him, he didn't support them, and they were very rarely able to go out and do anything coherent. So he did overcome all of that eventually, but it took a long time. And how he overcame it and why and what, a lot of it with David's help, I think that is definitely another story. So we know that David loved the Iggy and the Stooges music that Ron introduced him to on that trip. And he finally met Iggy while in New York for the RCA signing in September of that year. How did that meeting happen? After the RCA signing, David and Angela and probably Z went to a club in New York called Max's Kansas City. And there they met Lisa Robinson, who was a music journalist. I think she wrote for Time. Anyway, she was very well known and she often went to Max's to see what was going on. Danny Fields, who was a New York manager, was also there. David asked if they knew Iggy and Lisa said to Danny Fields, why don't you get a hold of Iggy and tell him to come and meet us? It happened that Iggy was in a recovery program, methadone probably, and he was staying at Danny Fields' house. So Danny Fields calls him up and he comes down to Max's a few hours later, meets meets up with David, and they hit it off. And I'm there as well at that point in time. So I meet Iggy as well. And I say, when I'm ready to leave, why don't you come and have breakfast with us? at the Warwick Hotel. That's how I met Iggy. The next morning, he shows up and he is um, wearing a pair of cut-off denims with a hole in the, uh, the back and a T-shirt. I'm actually having breakfast. Iggy orders three or four breakfasts. And then we start talking about what he'd like to do, what he could possibly do and what his situation is. It turns out that he's in a contract with Electra, which was Electra Records then. Jack Holtzman, I knew, who was the head of Electra. And it was a small, independent record company. And they had made one or two albums already with Iggy and the Stooges. And that, they hadn't proved too successful. So I said to James, um, let me have a word with, Jack Holtzman, and then we'll see what we can do. And then I asked Z, Tony Zanetta that is, who'd been in the meeting to call up the factory and arrange for David and Angela and I and himself to go and meet Andy Warhol. And David and Andy had a very peculiar meeting where they didn't really talk to each other and David played a record he'd made for a song called Andy Warhol, which Andy didn't comment on, but he did tell David that he liked his yellow Mary Jane patterned shoes. Meanwhile, I had a long conversation with Andy and um, Paul Morrissey, who was his partner and business manager. And there's an ongoing Ron Oberman connection in the Iggy story, because after Ron left Mercury, having worked with David, he moved to Columbia Records. Can you explain Ron's link there? Our next encounter, that is to say main man's next encounter with Ron, was after we'd made a deal at CBS, or as it then was, Columbia Records. That deal was for an album which became Raw Power, and the deal itself was signed in 1972. The recording was made that year and issued in... March of 1973. By that time, Ron Oberman had moved to Columbia as head of A&R. And in that capacity, 
he may have influenced Clive Davis, who was head of Columbia Records at the time, and someone that I had a very good relationship with, to consider taking Iggy on, partly because he was already aware of Iggy, having introduced David to one of Iggy's earlier recordings. And he was also interested in following up what he saw as the next new important, or one of the next new important acts, and aware that Bowie might be involved in making the next Iggy recordings, which he did become, at least at the mixing stage, involved. And also, I think, aware that I would deliver the best recording that Iggy could make. And many of those factors might have influenced Clive to rapidly, i.e. as soon as we or I offered him Iggy, he rapidly signed him up and we made the Raw Pat album. So in 1973, when the album's been released and we've started to do concerts, I'm talking directly to Ron about how we are going to be able to promote that album, promote Iggy as a performer, and that's the next time Ron's in the picture. During that period, Main Man have opened a very first foreign management office in Tokyo and have also received an offer from Carnegie Hall to put Iggy on in May of 73, which they subsequently withdraw. And we have to let Ron know that at least temporarily, Iggy is unable to do live performances and they should try and use video footage of previous performances to promote Raw Power, which has recently been released. And I was talking about videotapes of his earlier Stooges performances. Um, so some very, very good ones that CBS already had because I'd, I'd acquired them and given them. And some of them we actually put up on um, the BBC. At least one on, went on the old Grey Whistle Test. These were when Iggy's walking on the crowd, the first stage diving that was ever filmed, actually. It was a long, big old concert. He was, wasn't that famous then, but it actually made him, that one bit of footage made him enormously popular all over America in the underground music arena because nobody had done that before. People didn't walk on the crowd. I mean, that was very much an Iggy thing. At the time no specifics were provided as to why the Carnegie Hall concert didn't happen as part of the Raw Power launch. But you can now explain everything. So what did happen at the infamous Detroit concert that meant that you had to explain to Ron and Clive Davis that Iggy couldn't appear at Carnegie Hall? Iggy subsequently describes it as a fabulous show. But of course, he was out of his mind at the time. So it may have appeared a fabulous show to him. He had pawned all the rehearsal equipment in Detroit to support the purchase of heroin and probably cocaine for not just himself, but including some members of the band. And most importantly, one of the items he pawned and we never recovered was a custom-made fire engine red guitar that I had paid for because Iggy was very small and couldn't generally play a full-size guitar. So this guitar really fitted him and suited him, and it ended up being pawned for drugs. So I wasn't particularly happy with that either. I only arrived a few days before the concert because I had expected them to be rehearsing and up to speed. When I got there, I discovered all of this bad news and that they weren't. We'd already set up the concert. We'd advertised it. We'd promoted it. We couldn't cancel We couldn't do one of those, he's lost his voice, because Iggy was not the kind of performer that needed his voice to perform. He could have performed mute. The band couldn't have lost their ability to play in that same time frame, although they sort of did. And we couldn't make the simple announcement of the band have been on narcotics for the last two weeks, so they can't perform. 
So absent all of those things, we had to put them into rehearsal, a strenuous rehearsal session and a strenuous clean-up session for the few remaining days, buy a whole bunch of new equipment to rehearse and perform with, some of it we rented actually, and um, hope that the concert went well. Well, for some of the people in the audience who were really, really dedicated, hardline Iggy fans, it was just another Stooges concert where anything can happen and often did. They didn't even notice that Iggy was higher than a kite. They just saw it's business as usual. Some of the press folk did notice that the whole thing was a disaster. And Clive, who was by and large pretty much straight, I mean, Clive was a lawyer. All the people at Columbia who ended up in executive positions were lawyers. It's a tradition. They started with John Hammond, I think. At any rate, um, he was not happy. And I'm not sure what Ron said to him at the time, if he anything. But Clive basically had decided he's not going to promote the album until he sees something that makes it promotable. And didn't really have a hit single on. Had some great songs on. I mean, some of the songs have become really, really important songs since the album was made. But right then, nobody was looking at, say, Search and Destroy and saying, wow, that is a hell of a song. I mean, if you think about someone who says, I'm the world's forgotten boy, my mission is to search and destroy, He's talking about Vietnam, and that is an amazing Vietnam song. So there should have been a much bigger effort at CBS, but I couldn't get them engaged after that. It was very, very hard to get them engaged. Finally, at the end of the day, you have essentially an album, Raw Power itself. You have your pretty faces going to hell. You have Gimme Danger. You have all these songs, um, and of course, um, the place, that, that album sort of puts a pin, or a, what would you call that, a spike. It puts a spike in the history of punk. There's never been a more outrageous, but well-crafted and astonishing album in that era, in that space. All the people who came after that whether they were Americans or British, they all essentially were copycats. And Iggy did it again much later on. Well, not that much later on. He did it again with Lust for Life and The Idiot and the songs on those albums, which are equally compelling when you really listen to them. So these are the things that, if you like, the good side of Iggy. The bad side was that he was incapable in that era in those years, whether it was on Electra or on Columbia, of keeping out of trouble. He was trouble. So that's a look at the main man connection to Ron Oberman, who arranged David Bowie's first visit to America 50 years ago and subsequently worked with main man again when at Columbia Records with Iggy Pop. There are some great pieces of rock memorabilia from this period in rock history that are part of an ever-growing archive of Main Man documents, including articles, telexes, letters and production notes, a lot of them never seen before, that we are adding to the Main Man label website each week. It's a really fascinating record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. In the next episode, we'll explore another main man connection between two rock stars who created historic music together, Mick Ronson and John Mellencamp. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening.